Welcome to Leo's Bag of Tricks, Learning Electronics, Episode 3. Let's go. Let's take our DMM, or Digital Multimeter, and put it on the volts range, and let's investigate some batteries. The first thing I like to do is to check the zero offset of my meter. We connect the probes together and check that it reads pretty much zero. It's reading within a millivolt of zero. Good enough. I bought a fresh pack of AA alkaline batteries. These guys typically read about 1.6 volts when they're brand spanking new. If we measure all the batteries, we can see they're all within about 10 millivolts of 1.6 volts. Now stacking them together, we can clearly see now how the battery voltage adds arithmetically. If one battery is 1.6 volts, two in series gives us 3.2. If we add another one, three in series, we get 4.8 volts and a total of 6.4 when we use four batteries. If we take our four battery stack up here and we leave the black negative lead in the center, we can read positive 3.2 volts on one end and negative 3.2 volts on the other. From this, it should be obvious to see that all these voltage readings are relative. It's the relative voltage difference between the positive and negative leads of the meter that gives us our reading. If we reverse the leads and measure again, the polarity of the reading is reversed. It goes from positive to negative or negative to positive, depending on which way you go. Since all of our voltage readings are relative, it's really important that we define what our relative reference point is. In a typical circuit, we measure voltages with respect to ground. Ground is just a point in the circuit that we've defined to be our zero volt reference. Now the concept of ground gets pretty deep and I could probably do a whole other video on it and I probably will. For now, you can just think of it as an arbitrarily defined zero volt reference point in our circuit. If we take the two batteries and now connect them back to back and measure the total voltage, we get basically zero. Because what's happening is we're adding minus 1.6 and positive 1.6. They cancel out to zero. If we throw in another battery here, we end up with a voltage of 1.6 because the two batteries that oppose each other have summed to zero. The remaining voltage comes from the, the new battery, which has a voltage of 1.6 volts, and that's what we read. Playing around with these different combinations of batteries and different orientations, we can see that the total output voltage is always equal to the sum of all the batteries, taking the polarity into account. The opposing polarities subtract from each other, while the polarities that are the same add to the voltage. If you take eight D cell batteries and you connect them all in series, you end up with 12 volts, exactly the same as a car battery. Have you ever wondered why this stack of D cells cannot be used to start an automobile? Well, the simplistic answer might be, well, it just can't produce the amps, but that's not really a complete understanding. Let's dig in and figure this out. As usual, the answer usually lies in a careful examination of the data sheet. So here we have the data sheet for a typical Duracell 1.5 volt D cell battery. If we look at the specifications, we find the parameter called impedance. Now for the purposes of this exercise, impedance and resistance are the same thing. Just know that the complete definition of impedance takes into account the frequency dependent effects of inductance and capacitance. But for now, just think of it as the equivalent of resistance. The impedance of this battery is listed as 136 M ohms. And what that means is 136 milli ohms or 0.136 ohms. What this means is that inside the battery in series with the actual voltage source is 136 milliohms of resistance. 
This resistance comes from the physical construction of the battery, the thin sheet metal can that forms the negative electrode, the carbon rod that forms the positive electrode, and the electrolyte itself. So let's draw a model of what this real battery really looks like. It's a voltage source of 1.5 volts in series with a 136 milliohm resistor. Now looking at our eight cell stack, we end up with eight voltage sources in series with eight resistances. We can simplify this to a single battery of 12 volts in series with a single resistor of 1.088 ohms. All we did is just add up the resistance and the voltage because it's all in series. Now let's take a look at a typical automobile starter motor. Typically, it takes around 2,000 watts of power to turn over the engine, and that breaks down to about 200 amps at about 10 volts. The 10 volts is the battery voltage when it's under load. Using Ohm's law, we can come up with an equivalent resistance that represents the starter motor. If we know the starter motor draws 200 amps when 10 volts is applied to it, we can simply divide 10 volts by 200 and we come up with an equivalent resistance of 0.05 ohms or 50 milliohms. Now let's draw the equivalent circuit of this setup. So we start with our 12 volt battery which has its internal resistance of 1.088 ohms and we have a switch, the starter switch, and then we have the starter motor with its equivalent resistance of 50 milliohms. So what happens when we hit the switch? Well, let's figure that out. First, let's add the two resistances in series. 1.088 ohms and 50 milliohms adds up to 1.138 ohms of total resistance. Dividing our battery voltage by this resistance yields a circuit current of 10.54 amps. Now right away you can see this is a total fail. 10.5 amps is not going to turn the starter motor. So let's look at this from an energy point of view. If we have 10.54 amps flowing through our starter motor, which is 50 milliohms, we can figure out the voltage drop across the starter. We simply multiply the current times the resistance. That yields 0.527 volts. Now we can calculate the power in the starter motor by multiplying that voltage times the 10.54 amps. That gives us 5.5 watts of power dissipation in the starter motor. Now let's figure out the total amount of power that's actually being generated by the electrochemical cells. We just multiply 12 volts by 10.54 amps. That gives us a power dissipation of 126.48 watts. So you can see a lot of power is actually being generated, but most of it ends up just heating up the batteries. The internal resistance dissipates most of the power. The unfavorable ratio of the load resistance to the internal resistance means that the majority of the battery's voltage appears across the internal resistance, and therefore most of the power also just burns up inside as well. Now I know that in reality, the 10 amps of current flow is probably not even enough to pull in the starter solenoid. But if the starter solenoid were to engage, the additional load of the motor would drop the voltage so low that it would immediately drop out. It might just sit there and chatter. A proper car battery in a good state of charge usually has an internal impedance of around 10 milliohms or about a hundred times less than our stack of D-cells. It's this difference in source impedance that makes all the difference. When you look at the construction of a car battery, you can see that all of the metal parts are huge and very thick. It's totally designed to have the minimum source impedance possible. So what's the point of this exercise anyway? Well, the point is to understand that all voltage sources, be it a battery, a power supply, or signal source, they all have a finite source impedance. And that source impedance determines to a huge degree how that voltage is going to interact with things that you connect it to. So it's really important to wrap your head around this whole concept. A theoretical ideal voltage source would have zero ohms of source impedance, 
which implies that if you shorted it out, it would be able to supply an infinite amount of current, which of course is not possible. So all real world voltage sources have some finite amount of source impedance. When we say something is stiff, we usually mean that it doesn't sag or droop when you put a load on it. And that's the exact same terminology we use in electronics to describe a voltage source that has a low source impedance. When you load it, the voltage shouldn't droop very much because that's exactly what you want it to do. You want it to be solid. We'll often use a voltage divider to create a reference voltage in a circuit. But we always have to remember to consider what that voltage is going to be driving. We want to make sure that the source impedance of our voltage divider is at least 10 times lower than the thing that it's going to be driving. Otherwise, the thing that's getting driven is going to load it down and the voltage will droop unacceptably. So that ratio is very useful. But the other downside here is that you've got to understand that if you start going crazy with that and you use really low value resistors to get that good stiff voltage, you're going to be wasting a ton of power. And that's where active regulators come into play. They solve this problem through a little bit of magic. Let's consider for a moment a regulated DC power supply. Its job is to maintain the output voltage at a constant level regardless of the load applied to it. What this effectively means is the regulating circuitry actually artificially reduces the output impedance by compensating for the internal voltage drops inside the power supply. This scheme works just great up until the point where the power supply can no longer keep up with the current that's demanded by the load. At this point, the output impedance rises dramatically and the voltage collapses. We have just overloaded our power supply. One of the most basic tasks when designing electronic stuff is to make sure that you're powering everything correctly because things don't work well if they're not given the right supply of energy, meaning the correct voltage and polarity at the correct source impedance level to satisfy the needs of the device you're powering. In a typical schematic, you might see horizontal lines that run across the page, usually at the top and the bottom, like railroad tracks. These are called the supply rails for obvious reasons. All of the components that need power tap into these lines throughout the whole schematic. It's important that you supply the correct voltage and polarity to these rails if you want your circuit to work. Some circuits require more than one voltage. You'll see positive rails and even negative rails in certain analog circuits. This concept of rails has worked its way deep into the language of electronics. Sometimes you'll see a data sheet for an op amp that says rail to rail input and output. And what that means is it works with voltages that go all the way to the plus and minus rails. Or someone might say the output is stuck at the rail. And what that means is that the output voltage is at one of the power supply extremes rather than some intermediate level it's supposed to be. When using any integrated circuit, the first and most important thing you gotta do is make sure you've connected all of the correct power supply pins to the correct voltages and polarities. You'll often see terminals labeled VCC or VDD or V plus. These are typically the positive supply voltage terminals. Ground terminals are often labeled ground, GND, or VSS, and negative voltage terminals, like we use in op amps, are often labeled VEE. All of these designations have historical significance that will make a lot more sense as you dive deeper into this stuff. But as usual, best practice is to make no assumptions. Read the data sheet super carefully. Make sure that you're connecting up the power supply correctly. So that's it for episode three. I hope you uh, enjoyed this and learned something. Please comment your hearts out down below and I'll see you next time.